Hello, and welcome to part one of a two-part People Make Games investigation into gaming giant Valve, owners of monolithic PC game marketplace Steam, and makers of games sometimes. For the last few months, I've been researching the colorful yet frightening world of online casinos that plug into your Steam account. Since these sites first appeared 10 years ago, they've allowed Steam users to gamble tens of billions of dollars in the form of skins, cryptocurrency, and hard cash. Websites that are at best sketchy and at worst predatory, with no way to tell if the odds they're offering you are fair, hitting you with fees when you try and withdraw your winnings, marking themselves to Steam users way below the age of 18, and showing little to no interest on whether you might be addicted. In this video, we're going to show you how these sites first appeared, and not only how Valve failed to shut them down, but continues to inspire them. And we're going to be showing clips from interviews we conducted with users of these sites, gambling psychologists, and ex-Valve employees. And then we're going to explain how one reason that Valve never successfully shut this casino industry down could be because they're profiting from it. However, I said this was part one of a two-part series. While conducting these interviews with ex-Valve employees, we realized that despite Valve being one of the most wealthy and influential companies in the games industry, it's also one of the most mysterious. And so, we reached out to a lot more people who've worked at Valve over the years. And the next video that People Make Games will be releasing will be a pulling back of the curtain on the fascinating way that this company operates. Seriously, it's wild. But for today, Let's talk about Valve's gambling problem. So, this is a report on how Valve enables a whole industry of shady casinos. But to start this story, we have to wind the clock way back to 2010, when Valve first put loot boxes in their games Team Fortress 2, Dota 2, and Counter-Strike Global Offensive. Still today, the two most popular games on Steam by a huge margin because this is when Valve's relationship to gambling began. So today, the games industry is doing a lot of really good thinking about whether certain business models might be unethical or exploitative. I'm thinking here about gacha games like Genshin Impact, as well as truly chilling products like Diablo Immortal. And in the context of these thoughtful discussions, we can look back at Valve's 2012 era loot box design and immediately see it's a little bit scandalous. So, as you're playing any of these Valve games, you're gonna receive crates that you can pop open for a random cosmetic reward. There's just one catch. You can't open any crate without a key, and keys can only be bought from Valve at $2.50. So Valve give you this crate to make you feel like you've won something, but you haven't actually won anything. You've won the opportunity to pay Valve $2.50. If you open a crate in CSGO, you and your new emotional investment that comes from your $2.50 sunk cost will then see a spinning slot showing everything you might win before you get your skin. This might seem like a harmless visualizer making the unboxing more fun and theatrical. It is not. There's a reason that the casino websites we're looking at in this video use it as well, and why casinos in America today make between 65% and 80% of their revenue from slot machines. The visualizer shows what you could have won. Ah, oh, and how close you came to winning. That's not true. What you win from a crate is decided before the animation starts playing. Ah, oh, I almost won a gold skin. You didn't, they're f***ing with you. But what primarily makes Valve's loot boxes ethically squicky is how the skins you win can be traded on the Steam Marketplace. Launched in 2012, the Steam Marketplace allows Steam users to trade, buy, and sell items in their Steam inventory, with Valve taking 5% of each sale, though this rises to 10% when trading items from Valve's own games. So, when you open a loot box in a Valve game, that item you win has a cash value. You're not just winning a skin for your AK-47, you are functionally receiving five bucks, or 50 bucks, or 500 bucks. There are skins in CSGO that are so rare, they have sold for almost $100,000. Functionally, Valve's loot boxes are scratch cards with a cash prize that also happen to function as video game skins. Now, Technically, when you open one of Valve's loot boxes, you're not receiving cash money because if you sell this stuff on the marketplace, you're receiving Steam wallet funds, which you cannot take off your Steam account. But for as long as there has been a Steam marketplace, 
there has been a grey market of unofficial sites that Valve still today let plug into Steam's API. Steam users can link their Steam accounts to these sites, and by selling your skins here, you can in fact sell that skin you want in a loot box for cash. And these sites are in no way difficult to find. While researching this story, I started seeing ads for them everywhere. Spoil aside here, this way you can take stuff you've won in Valve games and sell it on the open market means that Valve kind of invented the video game NFT back in 2012 just without any blockchain technology at all. And it works fine, you know, in case you needed any more evidence that NFTs are a brain-dead, environmentally wasteful initiative that was invented as a case use for cryptocurrency. Anyway, Valve launched all of this stuff and unlike NFTs, it had an immediate and lasting appeal. Prior to Valve adding these loot boxes to CSGO, the game had an average of 25,000 people playing it at any one time. But two years after this famous arms dealer update, it had almost 14 times that. Today, as I say, it is the most popular game on Steam. But these trading websites weren't the only new small businesses to plug into Steam's API. People also began launching simple gambling websites, letting people wager their skins against one another in a winner-takes-all scenario, or bet them on upcoming eSports matches. Essentially, letting players use the skins in their Steam account as chips in a casino. And if you won, you'd receive even more skins. And the really important bug slash feature of these sites is because you don't need a bank account or a credit card to play, you just need a Steam account, these sites have little to no safeguards to keep underage gamblers out. And arguably, no interest in doing so, because to the best of my knowledge, it's not like there's a police agency anywhere in the world looking into this. And so these sites became, and are still today, havens for underage gambling. While researching this video, I tested this by pretending to be 13 years old. I made a new Steam account, and after my dad made me a purchase on Steam, and I enabled Steam Guard and waited 15 days, I was then able to access the Steam Marketplace. And once I had that, I connected my Steam account to one of these gambling websites and was able to bet my skins and withdraw my winnings, and my dad had no idea. While gambling on these sites, a couple of things became apparent. First off, these sites are fun. It is fun to play games of chance and often receive skins that are cool or expensive or sometimes both. And even when you receive skins you don't like, that's kind of fun too because that's like a cheeky invitation from these sites to just have another bet. You can take those crap skins you won and stake them in additional bets. However, um, I also became aware of a real darkness to these sites because they make it absolutely frictionless to lose a lot of money really quickly because at no point do you feel like you're playing with real money. You're just swapping skins for skins. You're spinning wheels that give you things that then encourage you to spin more wheels and yet even placing almost the smallest possible bets I could. I blew through $20 of credit in under 10 minutes and worse my instinctive response when this happened was, well, I'll just put another $20 in. And I don't even play CSGO. I was keen to acquire cool skins, even though I was never gonna use them in the game, which is demented. I can only imagine how much more addictive these sites would be if I actually played this game. Now, I think when these sites first started appearing, at least some games publishers would have seen an unlicensed all-ages betting industry growing on the underside of their video game like aggressive mold on a piece of fruit and said, I think maybe we should stop this. But in the years that followed, Valve did next to nothing. And by 2015, this quasi-legal industry had grown to the point that it had started making headlines. Valve announced in January 2015 that they were banning seven professional CSGO players for match fixing deliberately playing badly so that people could win money betting against them on the betting site csgolounge.com. A site so popular that in 2015 there were more Google searches than there were for the leading online poker site. One semi-professional CSGO player that People Make Games spoke to for this video said that match fixing doesn't just still happen in CSGO, it's an open secret. Yeah, there is so much of it. I know people who have done it. I've played against people who have done it. It's so common nowadays still. On a related note, csgolounge.com is still online today and still taking your bets. But this is just one site. There were, and still are, tons of these sites. There aren't many professional estimates of the total size of the skin betting industry, 
But in 2016, one gambling research firm predicted that just that year, it would take over four billion dollars worth of bets. We weren't able to see their methodology, but even if you take that number with a pinch of salt, that's a wild amount of money to be passing through these sites. Especially when you consider that unlike most physical casinos, there is no governing body to make sure they're operating in a way that is fair or legal. And the marketing that these sites use is particularly gross. They enter agreements with streamers on YouTube or Twitch, who then go and gamble on these sites without always telling their audience that they, the streamer, are getting something out of this. Inevitably, the streamer has a great time and probably wins big, so some fraction of their audience then visits these sites to go and try out this whole gambling thing. The news and scandals swirling around these sites reached a peak in the summer of 2016 when news broke of a breathtakingly galling scheme from a couple of streamers, Tom Syndicate Castle from England and Trevor T. Martin Martin from the US. The two began releasing videos where they gambled on a site called CSGO Lotto, which they made seem so fun and cool to the 10 million subscribers they had between them, literally millions of whom must have been kids. Sure, we don't usually allow kids to gamble because society deems them unable to make serious financial decisions or recognize addiction, but these are just video game skins, right? It's just a video game? Then an Indian YouTuber called Honor the Call checked CSGO Lotto's Articles of Incorporation and it turned out that T. Martin and Syndicate were the president and vice president of CSGO Lotto. And the reason they kept winning was because they'd rigged the games and all the excited shouting they were doing was acting. T. Martin and Syndicate were charged with several civil lawsuits for, you know, embarking on an unlabeled advertising campaign in which they tried to shuttle millions of impressionable teens into a casino that they secretly owned. But by 2017, it is my great displeasure to tell you that the pair's lawyer had gotten all of these lawsuits dismissed, using an argument that's altogether too depressing for me to get into here, but it involved the restaurant chain McDonald's. But T. Martin and Syndicate weren't the only streamers to get busted. Around this time, James Phantom Lord Varga, the world's seventh biggest streamer at the time, turned out to own a stake in CSGO Shuffle. Streamer Psy Syndicate was found to be working on rigged games with a site called Steam Lotto. And CSGO Diamonds was found to be cooperating oh with streamer God, Mo Assad. Kiri, Kiri, look at what just happened. At the time, Polygon reported that Assad's severance when he stopped working with CSGO Diamonds was more than 170 Bitcoin. Then, worth around $100,000, today, worth more than 3 million. These are just the streamers who got caught during the summer that everyone's attention was on this industry. By the summer of 2016, the scandals were so bad that Valve finally steamrolled into action, issuing all these sites with legal threats to shut down their operations. Now, in my humble opinion, that should have been the end of the story. Valve finally wake up and realize they can't let loot in their video game also function as casino chips. But unfortunately, that's just when the games industry stopped paying attention to this story because it seemed like it was over. But in the years that followed, while there have been occasional news stories about Valve taking further action against certain sites, in truth, these stories represent Valve fighting occasional battles while losing the war. Today, not only are the sites still active, they're more advanced and feature rich than ever. Just some of the more popular ones today include CSGO Roll, CSGO Empire, CSGO Fast, CSGO Polygon, Skin.Club, which claims more than 3 million users, and Key-Drop.com, which claims almost 9 million users who've made some 200 million bets. People Make Games was also told by the CSGO trading community that it's impossible to grasp the scale of this industry if you're only looking at the English language internet, as streamers all over the world are playing on these sites in front of their audiences. One thing that is clear though, is just how far these sites have advanced since 2016. Not only have lots of them grown into this busy, colorful, teenage aesthetic that is clearly aimed at young people, lots of them have loyalty reward schemes and mini games like you find in mobile games. And some areas of the casino are branded tie-ins with YouTubers. People Make Games reached out to seven of the most popular skin betting sites to ask for an interview. We didn't receive a reply from any of them. Although, Keydrop.com did have a listed address in central London, so we paid them a visit. Only to find that the building is actually a front. It's an office with a hyper-respectable address that you can pay money to for the appearance of having a classy location, when actually you're renting the world's most expensive post office box. 
I did feel kind of bad for the receptionist as we burst in on aggressive cameras rolling. But the funny thing is, really didn't seem like the first time this had happened to her. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, that's all from us. Thank you very, very much. But while we weren't able to speak to these businesses, People May Games did put word out that we wanted to speak to the users of these casino websites. And during these calls, it was made crystal clear to us that these sites are hurting the players of Valve's games. I just remember being a couple of months into the game and I was already like, you know, asking my parents, oh, can I get 20 bucks, like a Steam card or whatever? That's how it started. I started when I was 14. I was uh, 14 years old. I was about 13 or 14 at the time. If you level up, you get a random skin dropped in game. So we'd like try and bet those on the matches. And then it just kind of progressed from there. I was watching YouTube videos and I saw a sponsored video of somebody turning, I think it was $500 into like 2000, like, yo, and then I had a knife that my dad bought me for my birthdays. I put it in and I actually ended up winning somehow. I turned the $50 knife to like 200 bucks. Like, yo. Probably my first experience gambling would have been on CSGO Lounge. If you were like a Counter-Strike fan, like that was what the Counter-Strike fans did. Watching these games, like you could tell the people cheering the most, like they probably had some money on it. There was never an idea or never a kind of perception of, oh, you shouldn't bet on matches because you're underage. I think it was so well integrated into the community it almost felt like there's no problem at all doing this it's just csgo it wasn't gambling it was just getting better skins i would definitely describe the way that i was in middle school gambling on these counter-strike sites as addicted for sure like there was definitely a time at a, at a summer camp that i was at where i was like the gambling ringleader and i got a bunch of other kids to kick in 50 bucks and like it was really fun when we won and then it was all gone very quickly so I had about a hundred pounds worth of skins and I traded it in for one knife and I put it on the website, you know, obviously stressed out. It's Christmas Eve, actually. I was doing this on Christmas Eve, I see here. Yep, trying to get a Christmas present. And I put it on the website, builds up to 200. Then I go in again, builds up to 500. I go in again. I'm, I'm you know, over the moon. All these skins were worth about two, two and a half thousand euros. I remember that number very distinctly because I went in again, of course, there's no protections on these sites. Now, what I did then, it shows that I was into it way too much because I lost the bet, I had maybe 30, 40 pounds left of things that I didn't put in. I immediately went in again. Basically, after losing $100, I just took my bicycle, drove to the next gas station, bought one or two hundred dollar peso cards, went back home, came and done again. In my grade 11 math class, I remember doing coin flips for like 50 to 100 dollars on my phone during like a lecture like even when i was in high school i was like this could just become like a life ruining addiction it, i absolutely not should not have had access to something like that like in hindsight it's very easy for me to say that and it's very easy for me to realize like that could have gone wrong like it did go wrong i still gamble to this day and it definitely like seeded something in me that has not like gone away when you're in middle school you know what i mean and you just won 1500 bucks like that dopamine hit it's impossible to just like turn to just like shut that off you lose all your money in csgo lounge or a 15 year old gambling you're not going to just be like all right i'm done for the night you're going to be like okay how do i make another run at it but it could have gone wrong in a in a life altering way and i'm lucky that it didn't I thought, let's see what else there is to gamble on. So yeah, then I went into live casino basically, which is blackjack, roulette. The thing is, when you're younger, money has a way bigger value to you. After you finish school, you really need way more money to bet to get the same rush. Let's say I'm betting $20 when I was 15, I would now need to bet three, four hundred dollars. Now that I start working, I have a, I have an actual income. I'm now I'm spending a lot more on gambling. Like I'm going, you know, oh, I just got my paycheck. Now I'm gonna put in four hundred dollars. I just had this one day where I was still like stressed and anxious, thinking like, oh my god, I'm broke. Basically, I was just like, holy shit, I'm actually broke. The most money that I lost on one night was maybe five, six, seven. Okay, I uh, lay down in my bed and. <laughs> was thinking what the f did I uh, done right now and then I said to myself uh, yeah I think I'm addicted when I've put the 10k uh, when I lost them I was shaking so bad I left my computer and I came back the, the next day because I, I didn't want to see if I lose or win the next day when I saw I lost for me it was a dream like I, I, I can go to casinos a uh, real life casino but nah, it's not the same I grew up with the idea that if you have nice skins People will notice it and they will say nice things to you. 
I almost got kicked out of my parents' house because uh, I'm not proud to say that, but I stole some credit cards from them. CSGO Roll was actually the site I had the most success on where I only lost about $30,000. At that point, man, yo, I gotta stop it. I just like, I just blocked, I went on my router settings, I blocked every single gambling site. I said, yo, f this, bro. I actually do sometimes gamble still, but it's sports betting on real sports websites. You know, I have in my most formative years built up a habit and uh and formed some not uh, let's say less than beneficial uh, neural pathways also among the disturbing things pointed out to us by these sources was that because skin betting is a new and poorly understood frontier of gambling it was that much harder for these people to get support from society or their family and for some that was even part of the appeal and i like told my parents about it and everything I, like i think they kind of didn't really understand like to the extent of it. You don't want to tell people that like you're just wrapped up in it, especially once you get to the details and it's like peripherally related to like a video game for kids. I know for a fact my, you know, my mum didn't understand really what's going on here. Just, okay, you know, games, cool, whatever. Um, but if she knew that I'm spending real money to earn real money through gambling, she'd obviously be concerned. But parents don't know that because that's an intricate part of the game. That's also part of I think the reason why it was so popular uh, and, the, and so prevalent is no, how, you know, how would parents monitor it? They, they wouldn't know. Now, that idea you just heard from these people that getting involved in skin betting from a young age seeded something in them that hasn't gone away as they grew older. Within the scientific community, psychologists face a growing body of evidence that people who gamble while their brain is still developing, which happens all the way up to the age of 25, by the way, are significantly more likely to develop problem gambling later in life. People Make Games spoke about this to Dr. Serena King, a psychologist who's recently been studying the fields of both skin betting and video games with manipulative monetization. And it's quite obvious to those of us who've been doing gambling work for a long, long time in terms of casino behavioral economics that like, this is the same methodology, if not flashier. And so with behavioral addictions like gambling or gaming, and when you have those you know, intermittent reinforcements like loot boxes, you're constantly hitting the brain with dopamine. And the more you do that, the more people want you know, and crave it, need it to have stability in their mood. So I think that laying that foundation at a vulnerable time for addictive behaviors, which we know adolescents and young adulthood is, is critical for creating addictive potential. Now, while Counter-Strike Global Offensive is the tent pole of today's skin betting industry, we just want to flag here that this is not a problem that's unique to CSGO. This can happen to any game that uses the Steam inventory and uses collectibles, like Rust, which today is developing its very own symbiotic betting industry, one example of which you can see at howl.gg, but you'll find more if you Google them. We should also mention here that this isn't a problem that's totally unique to Steam. rbxflip.com is a website that allows Roblox users to gamble with their assets, but Roblox's betting scene hasn't yet reached the scale of the sprawling network of businesses that facilitate Steam gambling. And seemingly one big reason that is, is that Roblox Corporation is way more proactive about going after them. Which leaves us with one big question. Why hasn't Valve taken these sites down? Well, we got in touch with some ex-Valve members of staff who spoke to us on condition of anonymity, so their quotes will be read out by a voice actor hired by People Make Games. It's a very libertarian place. Valve doesn't want to say what can and can't happen on Steam. Another cultural foundation of Valve is a desire to have things be as open and accessible as possible. It's a chaotic, neutral company. They do everything they can to stay as neutral as they can, no matter what. But according to the people that we spoke to, Valve's philosophy hasn't just made them less interested in fixing these sites. Apparently, it's made them less able to do so. The main entry point to all of this is Steam's open ID. So one of the things we could do is create an allow list. But then we would need to create a process for people to apply. And then we need to create a process by which someone has to approve and validate those. It's a bunch of hard to automate work which is against the Valve ethos. The cardinal sin at Valve is that you cannot make work for other people who didn't agree to it. If you get the right people in a room together and everyone agrees on the work, then that's okay. But it's nobody's job at Valve to get those people in the same room. 
Valve doesn't hire for positions. They don't say, this is an ongoing problem that we need to hire people to take care of. The way Valve works is, here's this thing that we need to take care of this week, who's gonna do it? Or here's another quote from the semi-professional Counter-Strike player we spoke to. They are so hands-off. It's like expecting an alcoholic to stop being an alcoholic, you know, or an abusive parent to actually suddenly step up. Nobody kind of expects anything of Valve. Is that a good thing? Probably not. So that's how we get to where we are today. With all of these sites still up and Valve's management acting like this simply isn't their problem to solve. Well, Here's my pitch as to why these sites are Valve's problems to solve and why the company's disinterest in solving them should be a source of shame for the people who work there. So first off, as should be abundantly clear from the interviews that you just listened to, these sites are hurting Valve's customers and in some cases, ruining lives. But also, as convenient as it would be for Valve if these sites truly did exist outside of Steam's ecosystem, I believe in allowing these sites to exist, Valve is generating more revenue for themselves. And I'm not the only person who believes that. Here's another quote from an ex-Valve employee. They exist because they help Valve ultimately. The more websites that exist, where players can use features that aren't available in the game itself, the more it benefits Valve. There are so many pros to keeping them around. Think of it like this. We've got Steam over here and the betting sites over here on different websites and both industries claim no relationship with the other. But to start with, the culture of skin betting is for many people a feature of Valve's games as advertised by YouTubers and streamers and virally by your friends who are gambling. Valve is going to be acquiring more visibility and players for its games from anyone who finds this extra functionality appealing. Valve is also going to get more people playing its games simply in order to acquire skins that they can then bet. Then if you win skins in your casino, the people we spoke to always wanted to take them back to Valve's games to play with and to show off in front of other players. And if gambling ultimately becomes your hobby or a compulsion or an addiction, all the skins you're betting are ultimately bought from Valve. A thought I heard from almost all of the gamblers I spoke to was that Valve can't shut down these casinos permanently because that would wreck the market value of skins, thereby hurting every player who owns any Valve skins. But to me, that just sounds like evidence that one big reason Valve skins are so valuable and why people want them so bad is Valve allowing the betting sites to exist. Or let's make this even simpler. Just imagine you sell tiny paintings. And then someone opens a casino down the street where instead of chips, people gamble with your paintings. What do you think that's gonna do to how many paintings you sell? Or people's relationship to your paintings? Of course, in that analogy, you could argue that the painter is blameless. But in Valve's case, and what is particularly damning, is that Valve's own loot boxes act as a gateway drug to more full-throated gambling. Valve's loot boxes already ask players to bet money for a random chance of getting a skin they like or maybe getting a cash prize. But if those players don't then like the skins they get, these casinos offer them the option to cash those skins in for another random chance of getting a skin they like. And in fact, and this looks so bad for Valve, Today, the most popular skin betting websites for CSGO have moved past coin flips and roulette and simply repurpose Valve's own loot boxes as casino games. You simply go from opening Valve's cases in their games to opening other people's cases on these casino sites, where you can open more cases and do so faster and with a wager that you yourself set. The whole thing would be funny if it wasn't so depressing. You've got these betting websites realizing they can better access Valve's customers by letting them bet Valve's skins in games of chance modeled after Valve's own games of chance, all of which is enabled through Valve's API. And then you've got Valve going, yeah, I just don't know if this is anything to do with us. But of course, one reason I wouldn't want to address this problem if I was Valve is I wouldn't want people looking critically at these casinos because I think that would mean more people seeing my loot boxes for what they really are which is so uncomfortably close to gambling that the video games industry should already be calling me out. Like, what really is the difference between popping open a case in one of Valve's clients and popping open a case on one of these casino sites, even though one is supposedly a prestigious video game and the other is a casino that exists in a legal gray area? Honestly, I, I think the, the Valve, the skin boxes, they, they're like the same as the the casino websites. And further eroding any distance Valve might have from betting websites, 
While Peep My Games was working on this video, Valve took the unprecedented step of announcing that The International, their big official Dota 2 World Championships, which they shove in the face of every player via the Steam interface, would this year be sponsored by the website gg.pet. Dota 2 is a game rated for all ages where plenty of the top esports athletes are teens and Valve have taken a paycheck to advertise gambling to them. The best thing you can say about Valve's behavior is that it doesn't seem to be breaking any laws, a fact which also came up during a class action against Valve. In recent years, a bunch of parents of kids who had gambled on these betting websites took Valve to court, only to ultimately have the case dismissed because in the United States, loot boxes are not considered gambling. But here we arrive at the reason that I think it is in the entire games industry's interest to call Valve out for how they're behaving. Because in certain areas, like age ratings, for example, the games industry has been able to largely regulate itself. And I just don't know if the industry is being similarly responsible when it comes to gambling. People Make Games spoke to Ryan Morrison, who stars himself as the video game attorney, to speak about this increasing overlap between the video games industry and the betting industry. There is going to be a day or a time where people realize how many kids are getting systematically tricked into being addicted to gambling. They're, they're, if you don't think these companies are A-B testing the different kinds of loot boxes and looking at your, your shopping profile as a user and knowing if you're going to spend more or less if you win or lose and figuring all of that out to put it into the, the right endorphin rush of uh, you won this time so keep going next time, that's all happening and it, it's going to get worse and worse and worse every year as as at how these kids are targeted and it's not always kids i mean they're pretty good at doing it to adults too i, I don't want to make this just where's the you know help the children it's a problem across all age groups um but the the reality is it's 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 just never gotten the attention that I, I would have thought it would after 2016 and, and beyond. But while Ryan told us that he found Val's behavior regarding skins shocking, he also felt this was just one part of a larger conversation about loot boxes that the industry isn't having. I have had companies come to me of, of significant size, could come to me and ask for consultations on how to make sure what they're doing with loot boxes is legal. And one of the things they're doing is what is called dynamic odds, meaning if you don't spend money, you're gonna win all the time. And why is that? It's because you are now walking around in game as a billboard to everyone else who wants that cool skin you're wearing. So they'll give it to you because you're not gonna spend money anyway. But if you're someone who they know will spend $100 until they keep spending until they get what they want, your, your odds of winning are gonna lower, lower, lower because they know you'll spend more and more and more. That is literally rigging a system that it goes against every gambling regulation. It goes against every basic law in this space. And it's, it's happening in at least a few companies because they've gone over it with me. I can't say who because of attorney client, but it is, it's a legitimate issue. And I guarantee if these handful are doing it, many are doing it. I think the reality is that the industry is doing something it knows is wrong. Uh, when I go into the industry meetings, when I go into the, the rooms of lawyers or the rooms of publishers, you know, industry insiders or confidential rooms and everything else, it feels like I'm sitting in the 1970s rooms with the tobacco companies explaining to each other why tobacco doesn't, smoking can't cause cancer. Uh, that's what what I am hearing when they go over their studies of how loot boxes can't cause kids to get addicted to gambling or can't be triggering any kind of endorphin rush that's creative, uh, creating addictive tendencies. People in my games reached out to Valve for a comment on this story, asking, Given that in 2016, Valve sent out dozens of cease and desist orders to skin betting sites, why does the company allow them to continue operating today? The total removal of skin betting websites would arguably crash the value of Counter-Strike Global Offensive's skins. Is that something that Valve is concerned about? Is Valve aware that many of the Steam users gambling on these skin betting sites are too young to legally gamble in their countries? Does Valve consider it acceptable that for the people we spoke to, Counter-Strike Go has acted as a gateway to problem gambling? Valve did not respond to us, but who knows? Maybe this video coming out and the response to it will of course some people at Valve to have a long overdue conversation about this whole situation. Thank you so much for watching everybody. And don't forget, this was just part one of People Make Games' two-part report into Valve. The next video that this channel releases is going to be an extensive report informed by dozens of interviews about how Valve operate, because let me tell you, it's fascinating. Uh, so if you'd like to stay informed about that when it comes out, please respectfully press 
that subscribe button and YouTube will more or less do the rest. And if you'd like to support the work that we do, you can do that at patreon.com slash people make games. And we really, really appreciate it because funding this work is quite important because it takes ages. Seriously, it takes so long to investigate anything. I'd have never taken this job if I'd known how long it took. My goodness. But if you'd like to turn my bad decision of accepting this job into a good one, again, you can help that along by supporting us on patreon.com slash people make games. And thank you again for watching.